Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to CSIS. I'm very pleased so many of you decided to brave the cold, uh, rainy weather outside to join us for this discussion. My name is Sarah Ladislaw. I am the Senior Vice President here at CSIS. I also direct the Energy and National Security Program. Uh, before we get started, please just make yourself aware of the emergency exits. Uh, we don't expect any kind of emergency today, but do want you to be thinking about your safety uh, as we do, so please keep, uh, keep in mind the emergency exits here and then also going out the way that you came. Uh, we will uh, announce any sort of specific procedures if there is uh, some sort of incident. Um, I'm really pleased about today's event uh, that we've put together on electric vehicles. Uh, the future development and deployment of electric vehicles. As many of you know, especially those of you in the audience who do a lot in the energy space, electric vehicles are certainly one of the more dynamic and interesting aspects of a whole different uh, segment of issues as they relate to the energy transition. Uh, in the context of the work of, of things like deep decarbonization, electrification, of uh, the energy sector beyond just the electric power sector into things like transport is a huge part uh, of that equation. Um, in our work here at CSIS, we focus on it from a number of different directions. One is just sort of understanding what the electric vehicle trends are. Uh, how much has technology improved? What are we thinking about deployment in different countries and different contexts? What's the private sector doing? Uh, what's the policy space doing to encourage the deployment of electric vehicles? And really sort of just trying to understand some of the analysis being put out there by some of the groups that are going to speak today about what our expectations should be for the emergence of electric vehicles as an ever more prominent part uh, of our transportation future. Today's event is going to do some of that, but it's also going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to talk not only about what the outlook for electric vehicles is, but we're going to do a, a, have a conversation about the competition and, quite frankly, the strategies that are being used by different countries to think about being competitive in the electric vehicle space. Um, this is an observation that we've had uh, over the last year, which is a lot of different countries are embarking in what we call, for lack of a better word, energy industrial strategy, right? This idea that they want to be competitive in certain energy technologies, and therefore they have uh, not only manufacturing incentives, policy incentives, deployment incentives, thinking about how they're going to compete in that space. And so we constructed today's event to think about not only you know, the emergence of electric vehicles in the marketplace, but some of the strategies that are being used by different countries to think about um, competing in that space and, 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 how, and how maybe we should think about that increasingly here in the United States. I couldn't be more pleased with the group of people that we have here today uh, to have that discussion. Um, we were going to start with uh, Nick Albanese, who is uh, a replacement today for uh, his colleague Alexandra, who uh, fell ill and wasn't able to be here today. Um, he, uh, Nick is uh, the senior analyst on Bloomberg NEF's electrified transport team in the U.S. Um, he's also one of the lead authors of Bloomberg NEF's long-term electric vehicle outlook, which is going to serve as the basis for his presentation today. Uh, and then next we've got Garrett Fitzgerald, who uh, we got to fly in from a very snowy uh, Colorado. Uh, Garrett is a manager at the Rocky Mountain Institute's uh, Mobility Transformation Program. He works a lot on fleet electrification, electric vehicle charging, uh, infrastructure, but then also a bit on autonomous vehicles as well. Um, Rocky Mountain Institute put out this really great report uh, that, uh, that led us to Garrett uh, called Driving a Shared Electric Autonomous Mobility Future, which compared the ways in which China, India, and the United States are, both are all pursuing this future. And so he's going to speak a little bit about that today. And um, you'll notice that somebody is physically missing uh, from the podium today, and that's Jonas Meckling, uh, who is an assistant professor at the University of California, Berkeley, where he leads the Energy and Environment Policy Lab. Um, we really wanted Jonas to be part of this discussion because he's done some really great thinking about the intersection of innovation, energy policy, and political forces. Um, this idea that we need to be more uh, sort of uh, forward-leaning in terms of how the United States thinks about being competitive in various energy technologies or approaching the way in which we do innovation policy more broadly. Jonas is actually on the phone, 
Uh, he's calling in from California. Uh, you can imagine this week there's a lot of busy travel uh, with people coming back and forth from Europe. Uh, and so the most uh, sort of expeditious way of getting him involved in this conversation was to have him call in. He does have a PowerPoint presentation, so I know you'll all be staring intently at the slides uh, while he talks, but we're gonna try something a little bit new here today and try and link him in for the discussion that way. So we're gonna start with Nick and then we'll turn it over to Garrett and then uh, Jonas. Each uh, person will speak for about uh, 15 minutes. We're gonna try and keep everyone to time so that we can have a good discussion because I notice a lot of expertise in the room. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, and then we'll have, a, we'll have a, a nice discussion. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Nick uh, to get things started. So please uh, welcome, welcome Nick. All right, thank you, Sarah, and thank you everyone for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here at CSIS. I know my colleague said Hedbest has presented our new energy outlook here at CSIS for the past few years, so it's great to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the key findings from our long-term electric vehicle outlook, which is our flagship view on the future of ground transportation at BNEF. Um, just before I kick things off, for those of you who might not know, Bloomberg NEF, or BNEF, is Bloomberg LP's primary research arm. We're a team of 250 data scientists and research analysts spread in 18 offices around the world. And our mission is to provide primary research and data on the policies, technologies, and corporate strategies that are disrupting not only clean energy, but also other sectors like digital industry, advanced materials, commodities, and of course, advanced transport. So on that advanced transport team on which I sit, we're of course writing about electrified transport, shared mobility services, autonomous and connected vehicles, but we're also thinking about the associated impacts of these new technologies and business models on adjacent sectors like oil, power, and battery markets. So with that, I wanna spend the next 15 minutes or so talking a little bit about the current growth that we've seen in the market, what we think the main drivers of growth through 2040 will be, and then finally where we expect the market to go uh, on a country by country and vehicle by vehicle segment basis. So to kick things off, I think it's really important to remember just how quickly this electrification story has taken off. If you look at this chart here, you can see cumulative deployment of passenger electric vehicles in key markets all over the world. You'll notice that we went from a fleet of just under 100,000 passenger EVs back in 2011 to 1 million by 2015, 2 million by 2016, 5 million by 2018, and by the end of this year, we're expecting the global fleet of passenger EVs to hit nine, or 7 million, excuse me. What you'll also notice is that this is an increasingly global story. So China accounts for about 50% of the global passenger EV market, but we've also seen robust growth in markets like Europe, North America, and even in smaller markets, but important auto manufacturing hubs like South Korea and Japan. And this is also a story that's not just impacting the passenger vehicle market. So if you look at the public bus sector, for example, you can see a similar story. We've gone from a fleet of zero e-buses globally to one of over 425,000 units um, just in the past few years alone. Um, this is a bit of a different story in the sense that 99% of those e-buses are in China, but we have seen quite robust growth in markets like the United States and even Latin America just over the past 11 months of this year. And all of those those incremental sales are translating into real revenue growth for automakers. So if you look at this chart here, uh, it's a bit, a bit complicated, but if you let me walk you through it, you can see total passenger vehicle sales on the x-axis here, and then electric vehicle sales on the y-axis. What you'll immediately notice is that top right-hand quadrant is empty, so there are no high-volume passenger EV manufacturers on the auto market today. Um, but the, the key takeaway from this chart is that automakers generated about $75 billion in revenue from selling electric vehicles last year. That was up from 30 to 35 billion in 2017. And next year we're anticipating that revenue amount will exceed $100 billion. So this is translating into real dollars for the world's major automakers. Now with that said, EVs still only account for about two to 4% of new car sales in most of the world's major auto markets. So you can see here in some places like Japan where the government has traditionally focused on subsidizing and incentivizing the sales of hybrids. Think of how successful Toyota has been with selling the Prius around the world. Um, we've seen EV sales growth remain around 1%. But in other markets with robust incentive programs in place, like North America and of course China, we've seen EV sales slowly increase over the past few years. We're now in the two to four percent range at the national level. Of course, if you dive into that data a little bit deeper, you'll see some regional variation. So if you look at California, for example, uh, I don't think most folks know this, but actually last year EVs accounted for over 8% of new car sales in California. That's really important. It's the largest auto market in the United States. 
And of course, there are other markets that have seen even faster uptake and adoption of EVs. So if you look at Norway, for example, you can see that EVs have accounted for over 40% of new car sales for the past few years. And actually, this year, they've accounted for over 50% of sales in most months. So really robust growth. And looking ahead, we expect other markets to catch, catch up with places like California and Norway at the national level for a few, few, for a few reasons. Through 2025, we expect that policy will remain the, the key driver of growth. So policy has been the most important factor in jump-starting the global electric vehicle market, make no mistake about it. Um, but we also observe that investment flows into launching new EV models and deploying more charging infrastructure has increased in the past few years and will continue to do so. And we've also seen dramatic declines in the cost of lithium ion batteries, which is the, the core component of electric vehicles. So falling costs there will deliver cheaper EVs to consumers. Now globally, from a policy perspective, governments are starting to wind down their, pol their subsidy programs. And that's because EVs are now in that 2 to 4% of new car sales range that I mentioned before. So these programs become quite expensive. You notice here that in the US, these subsidies phase out after an automaker has sold 200,000 units. So Tesla and General Motors have already hit that target. You can see the, the other top players in the US market, Nissan, Ford, and Toyota, will hit that in the next few years. And that's really important because Toyota and General Motors account for about 60 to 75% of quarterly EV sales in the US. So most EV buyers today in the United States no longer have access to the full tax credit. It's a similar story, of course, in China. Um, because we've seen really robust growth there, the government has started to wind down its subsidy program. And in both markets, we've seen this translate into a slower growth rate for passenger EV sales. But governments are addressing that, and the main tool that they're using to do so is by tightening their fuel economy standards. So this is a national, or this is a global story, excuse me. If you look at this chart here, you can see that there are a few outliers. So Australia and Russia, our notable auto markets, account for about 2 to 4% of new car sales on an annual basis. They do not have fuel efficiency standards in place. The United States, though, is the only major auto market that's looking to roll back its fuel economy standards. So Canada, Mexico, Brazil, the European Union, India, China, all of these major auto markets are tightening their fuel efficiency standards. And based on the modeling that we've done, it will be very difficult to hit those standards without selling more and more EVs. So if you look at those markets, you can see the U.S. accounts for about 20% of passenger vehicle sales on an annual basis. So if the U.S. rolls back its fuel economy standards, maybe 20% of the market is exposed um, to, to less strict standards. But already 60% of the market has committed to tighten its fuel economy standards. So really, regardless of what happens with the fight between the EPA and the California Air Resources Board, most vehicles will be sold into markets with tightening standards. We've also seen some markets go a step further. So of course, China has a new energy vehicle mandate program. So automakers have to generate new energy vehicle credits. Um, they can do so by selling battery electric vehicles or plug-in hybrids or even fuel cell vehicles. Um, and that, as a result of this program, that we, we've seen increasing sales in China. There's also a specter of ICE vehicle ban announcements. So go back a few years, there are only five major cities around the world that had announced intentions to ban the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles outright. Zoom ahead to today, there are now over 30 major cities and regions around the world that want to do that, and 13 major markets that also have claimed to do so. So some of those markets are quite small. You can see Costa Rica is at the top of that list, but also markets like Canada, France, the UK, Denmark, and Israel have announced intentions to do this. So it remains an open question if those policies will be enforced, but if they were, that would be a big upside for the global EV market. And it's important to note that city-level policy can be an important driver of EV adoption. Uh, we did an analysis last year looking at EV sales in major cities around the world. And we found that six Chinese cities alone accounted for about 20% of the global EV market if you excluded the United States. So a city like Shenzhen had more EV sales than a place like Norway, for example. So city-level policies can be a big driver of adoption, and it's important to keep tabs on those, those announcements. We've also seen, though, a renewed commitment to electrification from the world's automakers. I mentioned before that they're seeing higher and higher revenue numbers from EVs. Um, we've also seen higher sales targets announced. So Volkswagen, Daimler, even American companies are setting higher targets for themselves over the coming few years. And this is going to translate into more and more EV models available to consumers. So this is the global product map. You can see that by the end of 2020, there will be over 400 electric vehicles available to consumers around the world. Most of those will be pure battery electric vehicles, um, but some plug-in hybrids will still be available, of course, to consumers that want that extended range option.
We've also seen more and more investment into public charging infrastructure. So you can see here there are about 630,000 public charging points as of the end of 2018. We're expecting that number will, will continue to grow at a similar growth rate in 2019. So the, one of the main upfront barriers to EV adoption, which has been range anxiety historically, is, is being targeted by uh, cons consortiums including automakers, oil majors, and utilities, and, and pure play charging infrastructure companies. But really the main driver of adoption over the long term is going to be falling lithium ion battery pack prices. So we spend a lot of time thinking about this at Bloomberg NEF. Each year we sign non-disclosure agreements with battery manufacturers all over the world. We just released our new 2019 price survey last week. And by doing this analysis, we found that the, the price of lithium ion battery packs has fallen by about 90% over the past nine years alone. That's really important because a battery accounts for about 40% of the capex of an electric vehicle. Importantly though, we also expect this trend to continue. So of course we track the supply chain for batteries very closely. You can see this is what the product map looks like today. About 365 gigawatt hours of battery manufacturing capacity all over the world. The vast majority of that is in China, but notice the gigafactory in the US there. Um, if you zoom ahead to 2023, um, 2024, the start of that year, you'll see that the supply chain is set to triple. So we're expecting that 18% learning rate that we've observed for lithium-ion battery packs to continue at least through 2030. That gets you to around $100 per kilowatt hour for a lithium-ion battery pack price as soon as 2024, and potentially down to as low as $60 per kilowatt hour by 2030. So of course, this is a volume weighted average. Some automakers will see higher prices, some will see lower. If you're producing an e-bus, you might have a higher price point because you'll have a lower volume. Um, but generally speaking, we expect this battery cost curve to continue, and that's going to unlock cheaper electric vehicles to consumers all over the world. So each year we take that, that, amount, that data that we've gathered from battery manufacturers and we estimate what the upfront price um, point is when EVs will be cheaper to own and, and to purchase than comparable internal combustion engine vehicles. So you can see here that we're expecting EVs to be cheaper on an upfront basis in most markets in the mid-2020s um, and as early as 2023 in some cases. So that's, that's not that far away. Consumers are going to have access to cheaper EVs quite soon. So each year we take all of that data that we have on the mega trends around policy developments, targets that automakers are setting for themselves, and the trends that we've observed with battery pack prices, and we come up with a long-term view on the future of ground transportation, looking at passenger vehicles, electric buses, and commercial vehicles. And this is, this is one of the key charts from that analysis for the U.S. passenger vehicle market. You can see that in the mid-2020s, we expect that the adoption of electric vehicles will start to accelerate as EVs become cheaper to purchase on an upfront basis. We think you get to about 60% of U.S. new car sales being electric by 2040. That translates to about 10 million EVs being sold uh, on an annual basis. And you can see that we expect most of those will be battery electric vehicles um, as a result of the model launch announcements we've observed from automakers around the world and just the improved economics of, of selling and, and owning BEVs. On a fleet basis, though, you can see that it takes much longer to, to transform the U.S. passenger vehicle fleet. So by 2040, even with that robust sales growth, we're expecting that only about a third of the U.S. passenger vehicle fleet will be electrified in, in one way or another. So that, of course, has important implications for, for oil demand and electricity demand. Um, just to, to start wrapping up here, you can see this is our view on each vehicle segment globally. So I mentioned before that there are already 425,000 electric buses on the world's roads today. That translates to about 20% of the global bus fleet already being electrified. So actually buses are electrifying much more quickly than passenger vehicles, and that's because um, operators are looking at this on a TCO basis rather than an upfront one. But you can see that we expect passenger vehicles and most commercial vehicle segments to electrify quite quickly as well. So that has important implications for oil demand. We're expecting global oil demand to peak by 2030. You can see we're anticipating some increase from the expansion of the fleet, both for passenger vehicles as well as commercial vehicles, but new powertrains, shared mobility services, um, and improving ICE vehicle fuel economy will reduce top line oil demand. And in terms of electricity markets, we're expecting about 2,300 terawatt hours of demand in 2040. Um, that sounds like a lot, but based on our forecast from our new energy outlook, that only translates to about 7% of total demand coming from electric vehicles. So there will be some markets that will experience demand constraints, but on a, on a global basis, it's, it's not a huge portion of total electricity demand. <laughs> 
The good news, of course, is that the grid is greening very quickly. So you can see here that even in a market like China, where you still have a good amount of coal capacity in line, we estimate that it is cleaner to own and operate an EV today than it is to, to own an average ICE vehicle. And you can see that in some markets, it's much, much cleaner to own and operate an EV. The sort of the flip side of that analysis, though, is that the global fleet of vehicles is growing quite quickly. So by 2040, we expect there to be about 1.6 billion vehicles on the world's roads. Because the fleet keeps growing, even with fuel economy improving for ICE vehicles, we think you get to about where you are today from a absolute emissions basis. So if you think that the main reason governments like the EU are subsidizing electric vehicles, you might expect to see more policies um, put in place to sort of accelerate this growth that we're seeing. Of course, there are a lot of open questions around this growth story that we're projecting. I'm, I'm happy to discuss those uh, in the Q&A. But just to conclude, I, I will highlight that you know, over the past few years, we've seen a growing consensus about this, the story of electrification that we're telling. So you can see here that our forecast lines up quite closely with, the, with what the International Energy Association is saying, but also uh, quite closely now with what OPEC and, and BP and even ExxonMobil are saying. So all of these groups are predicting you know, 300 plus million EVs on the world's roads by 2040. So so that's, that's quite remarkable growth. Um, with that, I will go ahead and pass things off. That's great. Thanks, Jack. And Nick, I will say that was quite amazing. That's a 45-minute presentation done in about 15 minutes. So right. congratulations. That was quite well done. Great. Um, all right, yeah. So let's skip through some of these. Um, yeah, so I'm Garrett Fitzgerald, and I'm joining you guys from RMI. If you're not familiar, RMI is a nonprofit environmental think tank. We're based in Colorado, but we have offices all over the world, and we do work in the electricity sector, buildings, transportation, and industry. And we've been at it for about 35 years now. Um, Nick gave a, gave a great overview of kind of where the markets are going, <clears throat> how they're going, and how they're growing, but I wanted to focus a little bit on why different stakeholders are interested in supporting that market growth, and really uh, be clear that although the general population might think it's climate related, when you really look at the policies and what's driving uh, those main sectors, <clears throat> it's a lot more varied. So there's, of course, energy security, industrial policy, uh, air quality, climate, and then we don't want to forget about the consumer costs. Uh, you know, eventually, they're going to benefit from this as well. Energy security is, is quite obvious, especially probably to this group. But if you can see, the U European Union, China, United States, and India are very large crude oil imports. This is a little bit dated data from 2016, but it's coming from only a few select countries. And what happens when you electrify your uh, transportation sector, not only are you allowing a diversification of that fuel source, so electricity can come from coal, gas, uh, renewables, but as you move towards more and more renewables, by definition, that's going to be a much more domestic fuel source, particularly renewable uh, solar and wind. Now, importantly, there are really acute challenges that are being faced in many of the major cities in the world. 14 of the 20 worst polluted cities are in India. So what you're looking at here on the left is a few years back, a satellite image of air pollution over large areas of China. And then on the right, just a few weeks ago, I was in New Delhi and they had the worst reported air quality index. And so this is PM 2.5 and PM 10. And these are particulate matters that can get into your lungs and cause significant respiratory illnesses. Um, it was really gross when I was out there and the population is demanding that governments do things. And so you can see, uh, why it, it can't be ignored by the governments. And as Nick kind of talked about, a big driver is capturing this um, sunrise opportunity of growing markets in batteries and in electric vehicles. So what you see here is over the past several years, China has by far become the global leader in solar PV production. They're doing that with batteries, and they're looking to do that with electric vehicles. And so other nations in Europe, India, and the US are considering how we can put in place policies that allow us to capture some of that market. And then when it comes to consumer costs, uh, 
because personal vehicle ownership is uh, a big decision for us to make, it really does come down to that upfront purchase price. So there's this idea of total cost of ownership, that's the cost per mile to own and operate a vehicle. And we're already at parity for electric buses and for high mileage commercial vehicles. So that is, if you're totally focused on the bottom line, there's a lot of cases where an electric vehicle makes sense today. In China and in the US over the next few years, we'll get there. I think this is uh, Nick's organization's data. And then, uh, Shortly following that, we will have the purchase price parity, and that's, I think, where we'll see a big tipping point. I didn't put a slide on climate because I, I think, although it's the biggest risk that we're trying to avert, it's not top of mind when much of this policy is created at the national level. Um, so, but before I get into really what different nations have been doing, I like to put a plug for uh, other ways that we can also address this issue. Electrification alone isn't enough. It doesn't address traffic congestion, it doesn't address land use, and it doesn't address parking, some of the real um, tangible issues that we face transportation-wise. So obviously public transportation is a much better use of the road space and moving towards higher load factor vehicles and higher utilization of those vehicles. Just before here we were chatting that in the US at least, Personal vehicles sit unutilized 95% of the time, so it's a big opportunity to increase asset utilization. Um, I guess, and by the way, when you're electrifying these vehicles, it's these commercial vehicles and these uh, public transportations that have the most favorable economics today because it, EVs really have an OPEX advantage over gas vehicles. And finally, it's really helpful to understand where we are from a starting point in different nations. So if you look, China, India, and the US all have a pretty different mode share of how people get around in, in large cities. With the US, obviously, is a very car-dominated culture. Where, when you look across India and China, there's a, a good mix of walking, biking, public transit, uh, two-wheelers and three-wheelers, and now, it's not necessarily by choice. These nations um, are moving towards being a more car-dominated society, but there are opportunities to ensure that as they convert to whatever it is they'll be in the future, personal vehicle or commercial, that those are electric. And interestingly, the chart on the right is looking at the total number of ride hail users and vehicle owners in the different nations, and then what that is as a fraction of their population and you'll see in the US, about 76% of the population owns a car, about 30% is a ride hailing user. Those ratios are flipped in India and China. And this has implications for why and how government policies have targeted commercial vehicles over private vehicles. Garrett, just a clarifying question on that slide. Is it, is it a, like if you're a ride hailing user, it's only ride hailing users that don't own vehicles, or is it? Uh, no, it's not exclusive, so you can be like myself, I own a car and I'm a ride hailing user. And this is just the number of, of subscribers and so it's not so granular to know how often they're actually using one or the other. Um, so Shenzhen came up in the previous presentation and it really is a great example of how city level policy supported by provincial and central policy can enable uh, a rapid transition. So Shenzhen is the leader in electric buses, but this example is looking at uh, electric logistic vehicles, so light duty uh, delivery vehicles. And over the course of two or three years, they converted their, nearly their entire fleet, went from 300 vehicles to 60,000 vehicles. And that was done um, with specific subsidies that supported charging and vehicles, as well as mandates from the municipal commission and then the supportive uh, city and state level policy. There were also commercial factors that played a role, so policy alone isn't gonna be enough to get this transition off the ground. You have to have the right models that can support the needs of the users and that they're willing to buy. And another um, critical component was leasing companies that would really bundle everything that you need to electrify your fleet, so charging infrastructure, maintenance, the vehicles, to really make it simple for this transition. And in many cases, uh, in China and India, they include the driver. Uh, particularly in India, the cost of labor is 
a smaller component of the total cost, and so they've done this transition by including a driver. And again, I wanna emphasize the policy factors are by having a cohesive set of policy that addresses the supply side to help the manufacturers uh, make the transition and help the demand side in terms of subsidies. It's also important to recognize the, the usefulness of restrictive measures on ICE vehicles, whether that's registration or increased tax. Uh, similarly, California is the leading state in the US. Nearly half of all EVs in the US are there and 30% of charging infrastructure. This chart here just shows the total number of uh, charging ports in each state in the US and you can see California is significantly ahead. Now California did this by taking advantage of the federal level uh, subsidy, but by providing supportive state level subsidy mandates, they created the ZEV credit program, zero emission vehicles, which required OEMs to sell a certain amount of uh, zero emission vehicles. And that created a market really, and a lot of those went to Tesla, but it has uh, done good things for California. Uh, another thing to note is the utility sectors are gonna play a large role in this transition. This is gonna be their biggest opportunity for load and revenue growth. And so in California, they recognize that and have been pretty proactive in trying to enable the infrastructure development for EVs, and in many cases, advocating that they should be the, the owners of that infrastructure. And then India practically is just getting started. They have had official policy on the books from 2013 with the National Electric Mobility Mission Plan. In 2015, they had about $100 million of subsidy that was directed directly towards the manufacturers. Uh, and in 2019, they've really uh, taken a, a big focus on this, largely due to capturing uh, what they what hope to be a growing market domestically and globally. And what they've done is they've kind of looked at what China did, what has been successful in the US, and developed a comprehensive program where they have $1.5 billion in subsidy available, but they're mandating that if any uh, public undertaking is gonna get the subsidy, that they have to have supportive state-level policies. They're putting in programs and subsidies for domestic battery manufacture and making guidelines for charging infrastructure and ensuring that utilities offer intelligent tariff structures. But what you'll see in India is that the large fraction of this is going to public transit, largely buses, and commercial vehicles. They're not subsidizing private four-wheelers. The only private vehicles they're subsidizing are two-wheelers. So kind of a summary, there's a number of drivers and barriers. What we found is supportive policy at all levels of government and cost parity are, are required and ensuring that a healthy charging infrastructure is possible. These can be done by a number of different measures, tax credits, ZEV mandates, restrictions on ICE vehicles. But what the key takeaway is to, to put together a policy that provides supportive measures for the supply side and manufacturers, but also on the demand side, both in terms of fiscal support and restrictive policy on the incumbent technology. What we see in, in China, those subsidies that were pretty lucrative that really did get the market off the ground made up about half of the cost of the electric vehicle. When you look at the United States, the federal subsidy is less than 20%. It gets up to 25% when you're in some of the states with uh, generous subsidies. And that makes a big difference. People are making these purchase prices based on the upfront costs. And finally, the charging infrastructure is important. And I wanna make sure that it's understood that it's not really a chicken and the egg problem. We don't have to build all of the charging infrastructure that's ever gonna exist now. In fact, we should be building it incrementally because it's very important that we get high utilization of these charging infrastructures in the early days. But this is just a fun chart. 10% of all of the charging infrastructure in the world is in Shenzhen alone, with two thirds of it being in China. Obviously that's because that's where most of the vehicles are, but just an important thing. Uh, I guess in summary, what we've seen is pretty, pretty good success in China, again, because they had, um, a consistent message at all levels of government that they're moving to transition this sector to electric. And they've done that in a coordinated way with the supply and demand side measures.
they were so successful that they're beginning to phase out those uh, supportive fiscal subsidies, but actually considering if, if it's not too early, as soon as they've announced that phase out, there's been a, a decline in sales over the past uh, six months. India recognizes that this is a big opportunity for them and that they can create domestic manufacture. So they've focused most of their subsidies on uh, ensuring make in India is the, their program. So ensuring that those vehicles that are subsidized are made in India with a certain amount of value capture happening in that country. And then in the US, which Jonas is gonna get into in more detail, we've really seen success at the state level. And this is largely because the, the message from the federal level isn't consistent. We had uh, a, a pretty generous subsidy program, but now we're considering uh, easing up on our cafe standards. So this doesn't send the right signal to the manufacturers, although as was alluded to earlier, these are global markets. And so what's happening globally is a transition to electric. And so that's going to, for lack of a better word, rub off on what vehicles are available in the US. Uh, but it's been state determined if you're gonna participate in a ZEV credit program, state determined if you offer subsidies, or in some cases, extra fees and taxes on EVs. And importantly, the EV charging infrastructure has been largely private sector led. And there's been a little bit of a battle between the private sector and the utilities on who can participate. Um, but in China and in India, there's a lot more uh, central and utility support for that. So that's what I have, and we can discuss uh, in more detail in the conversation. Okay, well that was perfect and I've got tons of questions for both of you, but what we're gonna do now is uh, we're gonna turn to Jonas uh, in, uh, out in California. I hope it's a lot warmer and sunnier there than it is here, it's kind of gloomy here. Um, Jonas, what I'm gonna do is you can direct me to uh, advance your slides. I'm starting on slide one and I'm gonna turn off my mic and we'll let you talk and then we'll engage in some Q&A. So hopefully this works, everybody in the audience, cross your fingers, okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Sarah, and hello, everyone. So we'll engage a bit in a bit of telepathy to coordinate slides and words. Uh, while Nick and Garrett have focused on the global picture on electric vehicles and electric vehicle policy, I'll now zero in on electric vehicle policy in the United States. When we look at uh, the electric vehicle revolution, we're witnessing something very novel, in particular in the order of magnitude, but both the technology and the policy have a very deep history. Just thinking about the technology might go back into the late um, 1900s when the majority of cabs in New York City were electric vehicles. But uh, focusing on policy, uh, there are essentially two generations of electric vehicle policy, and we're now really, really in the second generation. The first generation of the United States goes back to the 1990s uh, when California first adopted the zero emission, uh, emission Policy was later kind of um, backtracked and stalled uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and only in the more recent second generation of policies, it came back. So this, this second generation relates to the years 2008 to 2012, which very much shaped the policy landscape we see today. On the one hand, it was uh, Schwarzenegger's um, climate agenda uh, that required missionary cuts in the transport sector and um, led to the um, reinvigoration of the Zero Emission Vehicle Program in 2012. On the other hand, it was uh, President Obama's agenda to push electric vehicles through uh, reform of the fuel economy standards, but also subsidies for manufacturers and deployment. So um, in the next um, 15 minutes, I'll focus on three things. Um, first, what is the landscape of um, deployment policy across um, levels in uh, policy making in the United States? Then, What's the policy of innovation and manufacturing, if there is any? And what are the options 
uh, when we're in a more favorable climate to um, expand electric vehicle policy. When we think about the policy formula for deployment, not just of uh, electric vehicles, but more broadly in low carbon technologies, there is a very simple formula, which we see over and over again, and it is incentives plus mandates. Um, and there are a bunch of incentives in the US um, across levels, and several of those were already mentioned, federal, state, and city. So the federal tax credit was first introduced in 2008 in the emergency stimulus package still under the Bush administration and was expanded um, a few months later in the main stimulus package 2009 then under the Obama administration. And as mentioned earlier, uh, some um, manufacturers are now running out of this uh, incentive. At the state level, we see very significant variation in these incentives. Um, and um, we see, for instance, Colorado, Georgia, California having very large subsidies, uh, and other countries, uh, other states, uh, much smaller subsidies. And uh, the biggest share of these incentives are actually direct subsidies, uh, as opposed to more indirect um, subsidies through uh, powerful lanes, public charging stations, uh, et cetera. Um, if you look at the white bubbles, uh, they represent the uh, share um, in new vehicles. There is somewhat of a correlation between incentives and actual deployment, and some very significant outliers like Colorado and Louisiana having low deployment but high incentives versus California and um, um, Hawaii having high deployment but low, uh, lower incentives uh, comparatively. The third level of incentives in the U.S. Uh, policy mix is at the city level. Here in this uh, graph, the, the yellow parts of the city level incentives this is not as much about direct subsidies, although some cities offer direct subsidies, but much more about indirect subsidies related to carpool lane, lanes, charging, infrastructure, parking, et cetera. Here we see much more a direct uh, correlation between number of uh, promotion actions in a city um, and uh, combined with, with state and utility incentives and actual deployment of electric vehicles. So the incentive picture is pretty straightforward. It gets a little more interesting when we're talking about the mandates piece of the incentives plus mandates formula. So the CAFE standards after 20 year moratorium were um, ramped up um, in an executive deal between the Obama administration, the automakers and the state of California um, negotiated first in 2009. The CAFE standards are performance standards. They say something about the efficiency of the cars, um, and they require essentially from automakers to provide compliant electric vehicles as part of the overall fleet. Um, but they're, they have only an indirect effect on actually deployment of electric vehicles. Um, what's been the real market maker here is the zero emission vehicle program, which requires a certain share of uh, zero emission vehicles deployed by uh, sold by each um, automaker. Um, and apart from California, it's 10 states um, across the U.S. that have adopted this mandate and it has been the role model for China's zero emission vehicle uh, national standard. So that's essentially the, the policy landscape um, for deployment on the demand side. But um, to uh, Sarah's earlier point, this is also about industrial strategy and supply side. What has the U.S. been doing on the innovation manufacturing side? In short, much more on the innovation side than the manufacturing side. That's just a clear pattern. There's much greater ability to coordinate and the R&D policy side than industrial policy side in the U.S. context. Um, focusing on innovation. Here we see um, the patent applications for different types of clean energy technologies over time, which clearly shows that for electric vehicles, um, the, this has been uh, the largest uh, share of any uh, clean energy technology over the last few years. So it's a major game in uh, clean energy innovation. Back in 2015, alongside the Paris Agreement, the U.S. government, along with a number of other OECD gov uh, governments, agreed to double its clean energy R&D spending by 2020. Um, and um, we see that the U.S. is doing fairly well. This uh, map 
um, shows um, the countries that are expanding their clean energy budgets in, in darker blue, whereas those that have actually declining R&D budgets are in, in lighter or deeper orange. Um, so the U.S. is doing fairly well compared to peers, um, but all of the countries are doing far too little compared to the potential public benefits of significantly expanding clean energy R&D budgets. Now zooming in on um, R&D budgets for advanced vehicle technologies, we see an increase from 2018 to 2019 for battery electric vehicles, a modest increase, but it is an increase. Uh, the really steep increases followed um, 2006 and, and later, where battery became um, battery funding became a larger and larger part of it, um, and it's about a little less than 50 percent of the advanced transport budget. Um, so the U.S. is doing okay, but could do more um, okay in particular compared to um, peers in that space. The picture looks quite different on the manufacturing policy side. AVs um, present a major transformation um, of the manufacturing and competition in car manufacturing. Uh, importantly, they lower market barriers for newcomers. And these newcomers can be countries, but also different types of firms. On the countryside, we see a lot of kind of industrial operators, countries that did not have much of an export auto industry seeking opportunities in the EV space. Even California had some auto manufacturing, but not much. It's not developing its own EV champions. China, certainly India. And then we have these more smaller countries, Netherlands and Scotland. They're not going for um, their own EV models, but uh, are seeking a position in the EV supply chain. Um, in battery cell production and batteries making up to, to 45% of the cost of electric vehicles, China, Japan, and Korea, are um, the absolute leaders. So what has the U.S. been doing on supporting its uh, own electric vehicle industry? So apart from the stimulus package, not much of a coordinated manufacturing policy has emerged. Back in 2008, still on the campaign trail, Obama was envisioning a kind of a retooling Detroit for electric vehicles along with um, then Governor um, Jennifer Granholm in, in Michigan and uh, the Michigan Economic Development uh, Corporation developed a uh, plan to be built a full supply chain around electric vehicles in Michigan. And then the stimulus package sent significant funds in that direction, but it was a three year program um, and the results are certainly very mixed. Uh, one of the champions started at the time A123, when bankrupt was later taken over by a Chinese. Firm. The landscape of um, battery uh, production in the U.S. Um, is mostly now focused on um, battery pack assembly, um, with some limited battery cell production, and that happens mostly for direct investment from Asian uh, market leaders. Um, as a result, the U.S. is a, a net importer of batteries. Um, and um, or in battery components. It's just like the older data, but even looking at the uh, most recent import export data, uh, the imports are twice as high as the exports uh, on the demand batteries. So this kind of landscape raises a number of interesting uh, questions for manufacturing policy in the United States for electric vehicles. Um, first here is this ongoing question, Domestic cell production, is this what the U.S. should seek or focus more on the assembling of battery packs within the cost or the value creation um, of the battery? The assembling seems to be a, a slightly more important piece. And underlying this entire discussion is the experience both in, in Europe and in the United States with the solar industry, where with significant investments in solar, um, cell module manufacturing occurred but much of it um, then um, disappeared uh, with Chinese competition. So if uh, the U.S. invests more in, in domestic cell production, should it be current generation lithium ion or next generation battery technologies, such as solid state batteries um, or other technologies? These are the looming questions for industrial strategy. Um, and Europe for a long time, for instance, has not uh, um, given an answer to it until recently where they started uh, investing in lithium ion uh, um, battery production. So many are concerned that uh, at this point, uh, 
the U.S. and the U.K. cannot seriously compete uh, with the economies of scale of Asian market leaders. Then finally, here's a question beyond the EV space, but I think it's interesting because the U.S. is so distinctly different from competitors, is what about hydrogen fuel cell? Main um, automaking uh, nations that are competitors to the U.S., uh, Germany, Japan in particular, and also Korea, have significant investment in uh, developing uh, the hydrogen fuel cell and uh, the broader um, innovation ecosystem around it. Um, and the U.S. lacks this quite distinctly, or has lacked this quite distinctly over the last 10 years. That wasn't always the case. Uh, when we first started seeing kind of advanced transport technology policy in the U.S., uh, that was the early 2000s after 9-11. It was kind of strong interest from national security interests, uh, circles to reduce oil dependence and environmental interest in advanced transport technologies. Hydrogen was part of the, the mix, and it was significant investment, but they were then scaled back under um, uh, Secretary of Energy Stephen Chu in the late 2000s. So this is a kind of important uh, part of the question of where the industrial strategy for EVs and other advanced transport technologies should go in the United States. So turning to future policy options, um, where from here when windows of opportunity arise? We've heard it before, EVs are moving towards cost parity within the next five, six years. This is good news. But I think um, it's important to um, see that this does not lead to automatic deployment. It's interesting to engage with the comparison of renewable energy, solar and wind. You can easily deploy solar and wind to a market penetration of 20, 30% without changing the entire technology um, and policy regime. Then you've got to deal with um, flexibility and dealing with uh, accommodating the intermittency of these sources. But first, you can deploy it for quite a while. Electric vehicles are different from that. They need supportive infrastructure from the get-go. Um, and uh, so there is a key role for supplementary policies beyond direct subsidies and um, mandates to um, keep um, deployment going. In addition, we are likely to face a significant supply demand imbalance in the next few years. Nick showed us uh, the map of uh, where production capacity is all planned and deployment and dem demand is lacking. So it's critical for healthy market development to really scale up um, the deployment of the demand through deployment policies. So in the spirit of the season, here's a wish list. Um, of potential policies on the deployment and manufacturing side. A legislative deal on fuel economy standards. Um, the Obama deal was an executive deal and uh, uh, its vulnerability is, is very visible right now. So returning um, CAFE standard and the reform to Congress uh, would be uh, a key um, achievement with a long-term ratcheting up vision. A possibility, uh, maybe a far-fetched possibility, the federal zero emission vehicle mandate, and possibly a phase-out target. Um, many other nations um, are adopting these phase-out targets to varying degrees of uh, legal status, but they have a coordinating function for consumers and producers, um, as phase-out targets relating to internal combustion engines. So that's something to consider. Extending deployment um, incentives uh, as far as we haven't reached um, cost parity. And then importantly, scaling up procurement of electric vehicles uh, from uh, both um, the public sector, but also uh, the private sector. Um, most recently, Amazon's um, pledged to deploy 100,000 electric vehicles as a key part of this, these kinds of policies. Um, and then finally, Charging infrastructure investment would be very important for any Green New Deal or otherwise uh, green-related infrastructure package, but not just uh, investment, also a lot of uh, supportive regulation uh, around buildings, including charging infrastructure, to really um, keep pace with the deployment of electric vehicles themselves. Turning towards manufacturing policy, that's more of a question. Um, pursue the more actually market-based approach right now, um, or how much is there a case for a long-term industrial strategy on um, developing a complete electric vehicle supply chain in the United States, 
particularly in view of next generation battery technologies. Battery relates also to uh, kind of upstream needs of inputs uh, around um, rare earth um, metals, in particular lithium, cobalt, and others, which are all very much concentrated in, in, in China. Um, and the government uh, plays a role in securing these supplies, but also um, creating more closed loops um, and, and manufacturing uh, with recycling of batteries will be very critical. And that speaks to um, a larger theme where the um, creation of new clean energy technology supply chains may offer opportunities to create more circular economy style uh, production processes. I'll leave you with that thought and thank you for your attention. Okay, that was great. And Jonas, I know you couldn't see them, but I could see everyone's faces, and they were following you uh, uh, on every step. So thanks for doing that. Um, okay, I'm going to ask a few questions, and then I want to turn it over to the audience for uh, for some additional discussion. I'm going to start first with Nick. Uh, you kind of skipped over very quickly some of your you know barriers. Uh, what could change in this outlook piece, which is not an insignificant detail, right? I mean, uh, you mentioned we've got Seb comes every year and does your normal outlook and. Um, for lack of a better word, it's sort of an economically realistic, technologically kind of um, realistic in your approximation. But it just there's a lot of things that aren't in the model in terms of like assuming infrastructure shows up, assuming markets adjust, those types of things. Maybe you could just spend a couple minutes on some of the things that if they were to change either for the positive or the negative, your outlook would look you know, somewhat different. Yeah, absolutely. I think probably the, the biggest challenge that we've identified in terms of the long-term growth potential for EV adoption is charging infrastructure. So I, I didn't talk about this too much. I know we saw a few other helpful slides on this. And, you know, I mentioned before there are about 60,000 charging points in the U.S. today. Um, as we just heard, about, you know, 30 percent of those are in California. So you have the regional diversity issue in the United States. Um, they're not evenly deployed. But you also have an issue with the, the power output of those charging stations. So we don't have that much ultra-fast EV charging available in the United States. It's, it's publicly owned and operated. Um, Tesla has, has been a leader in, in deploying those stations. Um, but it, it's definitely a challenge. It's, it's going to have to be built out. Um, and, and really, it's, it's going to be a challenge because the economics of owning and operating those stations are quite challenging. So um, it is sort of a chicken and an egg problem. Utilization of uh, public charging stations today is quite low, um, factoring in peak demand charges and, and things like that, um, you know, it's challenging to operate these profitably. So it's not clear yet who is best positioned to, to own and operate those stations. There's a number of players involved in that right now. I think there is, at least in the United States, still also a policy risk. If we were to see, uh, you know, the CAFE standards rolled back dramatically and, and that were to be if that lawsuit from that came from California was put down, um, that that would definitely slow adoption in the U.S. for a few years. So there is some policy risk still as well. And when you think about um, the policy drivers that really affect the the outlook, whether it's vehicle efficiency standards or subsidies or those types of things, like what are, what's the biggest driver that if it was taken away would 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 really harm EVs? I mean, again, I think in the in the press right now, you're hearing a lot about the Chinese example of you know subsidy relaxation and and that harming a, a market that wasn't quite ready for it. And, but but in but in your world, you know which one's the the more impactful thing that you have to worry about being taken away? I would say fuel efficiency standards are probably more important over the long term because you can keep those in place and they they don't cost governments anything. So if you pull those back, then you'll, you'll see automakers immediately change their, their long-term product planning cycles. Um, I, think, you know, I think it's important to remember in the United States and China, we always knew that the subsidies would wind down. So it's, it's definitely disappointing that EV sales have you know, fallen as a result of that. But it's not surprising by any means. And if, if you believe that battery costs will keep falling, as you know, we've seen historically, then you will get to upfront price parity within the coming few years. So hitting those fuel efficiency standards should be easier for automakers in the future. And two more quick questions. One is, where do you guys fall in the range of battery cost decline forecasts? Are you fairly aggressive? Are you, you know, where do you guys fall in that range? And then the other is, I think in this outlook, you guys, uh, you didn't mention it, I don't think, but you, you actually did include sort of 
the intersection of uh, uh, of sort of ride sharing and uh, mm -hmm. and EV deployment. Can you just talk briefly about that relationship? Yeah, absolutely. So on the shared mobility services side of things, uh, we did a big data collection push, and we found that about five to eight percent of global VMT or vehicle miles traveled last year was taken in some form of shared mobility service. So a ride hailing vehicle, a carpool, something like that, um, excluding public transit. So that was, that was quite high. Um, but by 2040, we expect that will hit 20% globally. So we're expecting VMT to grow quite quickly, but the fleet to grow at a lower rate. And the, the primary reason for that is that, that we expect shared mobility services to take off quite quickly, and in, in primarily in developing markets, but also in, in places like the EU and the US. So, so definitely a role for shared mobility services. And then what about your battery price? Uh, so in the battery pack price survey, I haven't looked at too many forecasts from other groups. I know that ours is historically been considered quite aggressive, but I will say that the price we forecasted last year was only $2 off from the price that we observed this year. So historically, we've been quite good at forecasting prices, and we, we have a whole separate energy storage team that looks at that exclusively. Okay, Garrett, um, I really do commend this study to everybody because I think as it showed on your last slide, you guys do a really nice job of comparing the strategies and the drivers in, in China, India, and the United mm -hmm. States, which are not uh, similar in the sense that they're driven by very different things. One of the things I see a lot, and I often wonder to myself, is Shenzhen Zen is sort of held out there as an example. Is that a good example, or, or is it sort of so so much the leading example that it's maybe not the best way to think about what a realistic deployment strategy for EVs could be? Yeah, I mean, I think we can learn from what they did, and we were in a conversation with someone close to that transition, and they were asked, how did you guys do that overnight? And he frankly said, well, we didn't. It took eight years. Literally, buses <laughs> broke in half, buses caught on fire. So they had this <laughs> steadfastness, perseverance, and I think that's what's important, to have a strong signal to the market and to your population that this transition does need to happen and you're, and you're supporting it is important. So what we can learn from Shenzhen is you can throw a lot of money at the problem. I don't personally know how much money went into it, but I know a large amount of money went into infrastructure from the city government, the state government, and the center. But what doesn't cost so much is just to have a cohesive and coordinated policy at all levels of government. Um, and again, th what they did well is they put in restrictions for ICE vehicles. You make it really a little bit of a pain to operate a gas vehicle and make it a little bit easier to procure and operate an EV, then you can just uh, streamline that transition. Um, <clears throat> another thing, just kind of tagging on what Nick mentioned about the TNCs, the transportation network companies, and taxis, you know, they do represent 10% of VMTs, and most of those are cost effective to electrify today. So these vehicles, if you're driving 20,000 or 30,000 miles a year, which many of these taxis are, New York City taxi drives 70,000 miles a year, um, it's a no brainer to electrify that. But the issue is the people who are doing much of this driving maybe aren't doing it for a long term job. 4% of Uber drivers have done that for longer than a year, and they're not in a position to buy a new car. They don't think of it as a long-term investment. So somehow enabling those drivers to use an electric vehicle uh, would, would be a no-brainer, because I think the, the fuel cost per mile of an EV is about three or four cents compared to nine or 10 cents. And so again, if you're driving a lot of miles, you're really seeing those savings, and maintenance is uh, a real savings also. So can I turn to India really quickly? Because one of the things that I was curious is the sort of emphasis, and this will get a little bit to some of the questions we'll talk about with Jonas. The emphasis is really sort of on the made in India you know, model, right? It, is there a concern in, in India that by trying to make the vehicles or the batteries there, they're going to fundamentally make it more expensive? I, I, I often think back to you know, when we first started, when I first started doing this like 15 years ago, it was all about global supply chains. You know, the bigger the supply chain you can grow, the faster you can deploy technology, and now it's a little mixed, right? It's sort of about you know, can you manufacture it here? How do you do that? Is there some concern that that might slow down the ability to, to deploy EVs, or is it all helpful? So there is some concern, and, and what in their 
industrial policy, specifically around battery manufacturing and EV manufacturing, is a phased approach. So right now they recognize that there'll be a lot of component imports and a lot of material imports for that, but they wanna phase in some restrictions and taxes or duties on that over time as they can build up the domestic supply chain. And if, if they were to put into these policies in place today, it would certainly slow the adoption and would make it a little bit more expensive. But India's economy generally is, is slowing down a little bit and they're particularly driven by the automotive industry and makes up a very large component of their economy. So they're trying to think through how to balance that. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it's a risk and I think the, the folks involved in that policy are aware of that and considering it. I also want to take a couple of quick seconds. I noted my colleague, Nikos, uh, who writes on mobility for us, was really, really pleased, and as I was, for you to have that slide on, you know, this isn't just about personal EV mm -hmm. deployment. It's really about sort of multimodal solutions in the transportation sector. In your, just to stay on that for a minute, in your work, are there areas where EV deployment policies are running in competition with other smart mobility policies that you are particularly worried about in any of the three countries that you were talking about? Do, do they kind of eat from one another? It comes up in India a lot because in, in many of the Indian cities, the buses are so overloaded that the the population and the local governments are are of the opinion that money should be spent on more buses, not electric buses, because electric buses are a little bit more capitally intensive today, even though they're lower cost, total cost of ownership. So there's this balance to, to serve the need of the population who just wanna get around and aren't really so concerned about the electric component. So those kinda get into each other. And then I think there's a, there's a little bit of competition, or I know, between um, Uber and Lyft and public transit, and they're eating into uh, each other's market and Uber and Lyft in many places are causing more congestion. So there's a need for policy not only to encourage electrification, but also maybe some use of congestion pricing that gets more sharing and more pooling. We, we talked about um, if you use the vehicle more, it's more cost effective to electrify. So you can have a shared vehicle, which means I'm a driver and I'm going and picking up a bunch of individual people and it's, that's the same as a single occupancy vehicle, or you can pool a bunch of people in that, and that's kind of like a carpool, but then you can have one car that's operating 20 hours a day and a, multiple different drivers, so you're really getting uh, the best economics from that. And I think there's an example of Test Loop, or I'm not sure if that's the name of the company, but they operate Teslas and they're going on five, 600,000 miles, and they've had tremendous economics because they're running those vehicles 24-7, they benefit from some of Tesla's charging infrastructure, but. And then Jonas, I'm gonna uh, try and get you in the conversation again here. You know, one of the things, um, you know, industrial policy can in some circles, particularly here in Washington, be the longest four letter word that, uh, that you can speak. We don't tend to think about, you know, structuring the economy in, in that way, uh, particularly in free market circles. Um, but you are hearing more and more discussion about it now. I think one of the things that I run into for energy policy planners that's the biggest concern is how do you allow for proper levels of innovation uh, at the same time that you're sort of deliberately focusing on a particular technology, right? I mean, I think there's a lot of concern uh, as, you know, as, as Garrett sort of talked about, we, we're not gonna have the Shenzhen experience um, Oh, Garrett, can you just turn your mic off? Uh, we're not going to have that experience because we can't even make investments in startup technologies that don't succeed and not have to pay the price, you know, in terms of R&D spending for several years after the fact, right? So, so Jonas, one of my questions is, you know, how do you deal with this idea that we're supposed to be both incorporating innovation and, uh, and, and sort of not overly controlling that while at the same time trying to deploy lots of infrastructure and lots of vehicles and, 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 and sort of pursue that policy. So how do you square that in your own work? Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, and some people say the industrial US doesn't talk much about the industrial policy and doesn't do it in a very coordinated effort, but there's a lot of more um, hidden industrial policy, especially through the Department of Defense. Um, 
and uh, kind of dual use technologies uh, that uh, come out of this. Um, the question of industrial policy and innovation is, is an interesting one. And I want to kind of circle back a little bit to, to the discussion going on around, I think, batteries um, and, and, and solar. There are these two sides. On the one hand, there is the low-cost argument. Let's have a very large global supply chain and uh, just um, buy the commoditized parts um, versus more of the industrial Cummins argument, which says if you want a long-term innovative R&D strategy in, in, in the U.S. and our, um, innovation in new battery technology requires some kind of manufacturing base. Um, because um, R&D efforts draw on this manufacturing base. Um, so I think there is an inherent tension between these two. Um, and um, uh, much of it plays out more more the state level than the federal level currently. Can you, and um, one of the follow-ups I wanted to ask you on that is, you know, I. I, I really like the idea of sort of introducing politics into what we oftentimes think of as being a sort of techno-economic kind of uh, conversation. What, what are the, uh, and I guess what you would deem useful sort of distinctions between, uh, on your wish list, you had deployment policy and you had manufacturing policy. It strikes me that the politics of those two things are quite different. Um, probably both at the state level and at the federal level. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, the political challenges that you see or the political advantages you see of deploying either side of that ledger? Uh, and if that's not clear, I can go on a little bit, but, but let me know what you think. Mm. So kind of what kind of groups would be interested in either type of policy or what, what aspects of politics? Yeah, so what I'm thinking about is, uh, you know, if I if I think about your uh, your slide on your wish list, you had basically, you know, talked about, I'm just going to put it back up, you had deployment uh, incentives and then you had manufacturing sort of approach. And what I immediately sort of jump out to me is that the folks that are fundamentally concerned about uh, about some of the, the benefits to come from an electric vehicle or an electrified, electrified vehicle fleet uh, in the United States, some of the utility interests, those types of things, like they might be very interested in your deployment policies. Where on the manufacturing side, I could see lots of people who are concerned about competitiveness and energy security and national security, thinking about critical mi minerals and those types of things. Like the politics of these two different things are kind of different. Um, and I just wondered if, if that at all factored into um, what their either popularity or their ability to not get you know focused on as much uh, in in you know how popular they might be. Okay, um, so I mean, as you there's a much broader set of interests um, and actors involved in the deployment side, um, um, environmental groups, electric utilities, uh, the the auto manufacturers themselves cities, um, local air pollution benefits. It's a pretty broad-based um, alliance of actors uh, that have been demanding de deployment policies, especially on the incentive side. Um, with um, the, um, it's get, getting a little more challenging with the regulatory side, um, but uh, um, there is, I think, much greater political momentum on, on that front. On the manufacturing side, and there is, to some extent, there's a challenge of uh, creating a coordinated industrial policy in, in the United States, but it's interesting that we see this um, alignment from the left and the right around industrial policy strategy essentially as a response uh, to China's rise um, currently. Um, historically, I think um, an interesting alliance between the environmental interests and, and national security circles have been very important to push the advanced transport uh, agenda, though um, with the U.S. Um, now marginal um, oil producer, I think the national security um, argument um, is maybe less strong than it was in the 2000s. Do either of you want to jump in on that at all? I mean, I don't know. One of the things, uh, I guess, as an opening question, uh, I always ask folks who are particularly interested in U.S. competitiveness on electric vehicles is, well, competitive how and against whom, right? I mean, is it even realistic to think of the United States as a 
competitor market for EVs relative to places like China or um, purveyor of battery technologies, like those types of things, or is that just too flat a way of thinking about the way that these industries work and interact with each other across borders? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it depends on which metric you're looking at. Probably on the battery supply chain, the U.S., you know, based on the, on the data I've seen, would not be competitive with some of the, the, the incumbents that are based in, in Japan and in South Korea. That's going to be very difficult for the U.S. to challenge. Um, but if you look at, you know, the, the top selling models, of course, from that chart I showed on revenue, Tesla is by far the world's leader in revenue generation from electric vehicles. So there are a lot of Chinese companies that already have a larger portion or, or comparable portion of their total revenue coming from electric vehicles, but they're selling much lower value EVs. So they're not golf carts by any means. They're all highway capable. That's, that's the only data that we look at in our analysis. But, um, you know, to, to compare a BYD EV to uh, a Tesla EV is, is going to be, you know, it's, it's apples and oranges, so to speak. So. Did you want to add anything? No? No, I think that's fine. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left. I'd like to open it up to the audience. I'm going to take questions three at a time. If you just turn your mic off, sorry. Sure. Uh, and if you do, uh, we have some rules here. Please wait for the mic. State your name and affiliation question in the form of a question. And if you're quick, then we can get as many in as we can. So we're going to do these two and then this one. There you go. Stanley, I have just two quick questions. Uh, uh, do you have really uh, any relative cost, uh, say, per year between EVs and the standard combustion, considering everything, depreciation, insurance, original cost, uh, and energy savings? And the second question is, any thought being given to battery transfer? Uh, I know it sounds very difficult, but if everything was standardized, and including the compartments, it would seem you can press a button, the battery comes out, press another button, the battery goes in. Is uh, that a, any possibility at all? Uh, thank you very much. Tom Gross, a retired physicist. Um, it's obvious from what you've been all saying that battery technology was key to the lowering of the price and perhaps the ad faster ad adaptation recently. Another key uh, user of the battery technologies, of course, is the expanded uh, renewable grid uh, that it needs to be there for storage. And I'm wondering, which industry is driving which? Is the need for batteries for the grid uh, driving the development of battery technology, or is the battery technology increases for electric vehicles driving the grid use? Uh, Bill Eichert, consultant. Uh, Nick, main, mainly a question for you. I'm trying to understand your comments about the relationship of CAFE to the, the price parity and, and, and sort of it. If they, if they change CAFE, what impact it'll have. And, and the logic behind my question is, if the consumers are tending to buy fewer small cars and buy bigger cars, maybe slightly more fuel-efficient cars um, that Detroit's turning out, um, it, still, you know, there, there are good reasons to keep CAFE in place from an overall fuel economy standpoint. But I'm not understanding if price parity comes into in effect about 2024, like you were saying, and then, in, you know, full price parity by 2030. What's the real impact of CAFE either way? Sure, yeah, so I'll take that one first. Um, I would say the biggest impact is that automakers today don't have certainty on which type of vehicles they need to be producing at scale. So there's a lot of risk right now if, you know, if, if CAFE is, is not extended as as some automakers were thinking it would be just a few years ago, there's going to be a lot more, um, you know, potential for them to sell high margin vehicles that maybe they couldn't have with, with the cap day standards. So I would say that the main benefit is just removing that uncertainty with, with extending those standards. Did you want to take a name, the other, a whack at any other shirt? Sure, yeah, I can go back to the question on which market is driving which. So historically, consumer electronics was the, the largest demand sector for lithium ion batteries, but as of 2018, it was passenger EVs. So it's now EVs that are the main demand center for lithium ion batteries, and stationary storage is a much smaller market. Um, Garrett, did you want to Yeah, so I think just emphasizing how much the market is driven by 
EVs, uh, I think maybe it's like 60% of demand is, is for EVs today, but if you look at projections out in the next 15, 20 years, the stationary slice is a very, very tiny. I think we're talking about like two terawatt hours of annual production in 2030, and uh, less than 5% of that is gonna go to stationary. Um, and then I think there was a question on the, the relative price comparison from a total cost of operation for gas and EV. And I know you guys have a, a good analysis on that that looks at different markets and what the TCO is for EVs and ICE vehicles. So maybe that would be a good resource. <clears throat> there was also a question on battery swapping, I think, or standardizing batteries in and out. So many people are probably aware of a company called A Better Place that attempted to do that in Israel, and it was largely a failure. Um, perhaps it was done too early or it wasn't done well. There are success stories in Southeast Asia and largely around two-wheelers, so a light-duty motorcycle, if you will, and they have uh, <clears throat> networks of swappable batteries. India has largely looked at it, and because they have a little bit of challenge with their distribution systems and they have huge challenges with uh, land accessibility for charging infrastructure. They're considering battery swapping. There's a company called Sun Mobility that has a swappable bus uh, that they've deployed in a few cities. I think the, there's not a consensus that battery swapping will or won't work. There's skeptics uh, and there's uh, people who support it. I think that in the two-wheeler and three-wheeler case in India, it probably will work, and they have begun to standardize that. But for four-wheelers, I'm personally not thinking that's gonna take off. And Jonas, did you have anything you wanted to add to those questions? Um, maybe just a brief follow-up on Tom's question around what drives uh, what. I think that's a really important uh, question to think about uh, in low carbon transitions uh, in terms of cost, like consumer electronics driving the cost declines and um, deployment of the batteries and electric vehicles and st storage, but also politically with utilities um, becoming an important force in uh, these uh, policies, um, especially utilities that have already started going down the low carbon path. Um, then uh, pushing for electrification more, more broadly. Um, I think it's really important to think about these knock-on effects across uh, industries and the dynamics they create. Okay, we can do a one more round. Of so get back to this, the stationary storage question, I think it's, it's really important to think about how many batteries we'll have on the road already that can be used in some way or the other to help integrate renewables. It doesn't have to be vehicle to grid and bi-directional, but you have a potential tremendous amount of flexibility of when and where those vehicles charge. Back to the comment that a car is parked 95% of the time. So if you have the right type and location of infrastructure, most people won't really care when that's charged, when it gets down to it. They think they care. They think you want all this DC fast charging, but if it's available, at home or at work, you can get 99.9% .9 of your charging done. Um, and then those vehicles are gonna be taken out of, or those batteries are gonna be taken out of the vehicles when they reach maybe 70% of original capacity. And they potentially have a, another use case for the stationary application, depending on how fast um, batteries come down in cost. Um, but I think it's an important consideration. If we're really fast, we can get another round. All right, uh, Richard McFadden, elect electrical engineer, retired now. Uh, so if you take the use case of maybe 20% of households buying an electric vehicle sometime in the near future, knowing how, uh, how proactive we tend to be on a larger industrial slash governmental basis, are we gonna have capacity in distribution for 20% of America to charge up their car every night? Mercedes Garcia from the European Union. Um, you've uh, talked about um, other um, sort of consumers of batteries, like um, uh, 
electronic um, products, but um, there's also some talk about um, buildings needing batteries in the future to be more um, resilient and, and more isolated from phenomena like uh, the recent fires in California. So do you see that as, um, as a challenge also or something to think about in terms of in the future and um, having that as a source of competition for batteries? Hi, uh, Doug Miller from Energy Web Foundation, which is actually co-created by RMI. Gary and I used to work together. Um, so, the so taking a big picture look at the renewable energy industry, there's over 200 companies today that have set a 100% renewable energy target, which have driven so many new projects. Yet the conversation about the source of electricity for electric vehicles isn't coming up enough. And actually the work we're doing, one of the things is to try and guarantee that EVs are charged by renewables 100 at a 100% level. Why is this a conversation that's not coming up, and why aren't reg you know, regulators requiring that EVs be charged by renewables at 100% to create new demand for projects? Uh, question about, well, we're gonna have enough uh, distribution capacity, a question about uh, uh, buildings and batteries uh, and, and storage, and then 100% um, renewable sourcing for electric. Um, I'm happy to take the first one. So generally speaking, most utilities in the United States at least will have no issue really taking 20% uh, from the distribution level for home charging. And now when you get to this idea of large depots of fast charging, 50 kilowatt, 150 kilowatt, then there's gonna be need to do system upgrades, but utilities are really good at that. They've spent the last 100 years building out infrastructure. So they know how to do that. It's more about who's gonna pay for it. Um, but what we saw in California, interestingly, is if you have a city with 20% EV adoption, you will have neighborhoods that have 50 or 60 or 70% EV adoption because it's kind of, you see that your neighbor does it and then it goes, um, and it's also a demographic as well. You've seen in neighbors in California. So again, the, the utilities can install that infrastructure and it won't be an issue, but some areas they're gonna to have to do it faster than others. And PG&E has done a great thing, besides some of the other things they've done, in terms of putting out uh, a map that has the current load factors of all of their distribution transformers so that those planning DC fast charging can say, maybe don't try to ask for an interconnect there because that's already overloaded. So there's, I think, a, an opportunity to be proactive with the utility and, and pick where you put the charging infrastructure. Um, I'm not going to address the, the second question, and then, Doug, <clears throat> I think there is a lot of talk about um, EVs being charged by a dirty grid or a coal grid, but again, it gets back to what I talked about. A lot of the policy isn't about carbon necessarily, and so because it's kind of nuanced and a lot of people don't probably understand that there's a time of day when it's more carbon intensive in a time of day when it's not. Uh, that's not being talked about. But in, in California and other states, utilities are setting specific tariffs that say, we want to absorb the excess renewable in the day, so we'll offer you a very low cost. They even have two. They can have a, a, a time of use based on the cost to the utility or a time of use based on the greenness of the kilowatt hour. So I'll just add a little bit more to that. Yeah, I think, I think it's just important to remember that the, the U.S. power sector has been a downward, on a downward trend in terms of GHG emissions in the past few years. I think there's a general understanding among regulators and utilities and consumers that we know how to further decarbonize power, power systems. Uh, the cost of wind and solar is falling really rapidly. Um, and as I mentioned before, EVs in most markets today are cleaner to operate than an average internal combustion engine vehicle. So there already is a, a GHG benefit from doing that, even if you account for the embedded emissions that come from the, the full manufacturing um, process. So it is cleaner today, and I think it's quite clear that the grid will keep getting cleaner. So I think regulators simply might not be as concerned about that as they are about jump-starting um, the market and getting it to grow further. Um, to the question on batteries for buildings, I would say I don't think that it is any potential threat to the, the battery supply chain for EVs. Most of the, the lithium ion battery manufacturing facilities that come online in the next few years will be purpose built for EVs. So that, that's gonna be the main driver of demand, at least for the next five years. Jonas, did you wanna add anything? 
Um, yeah. Just to add to the last question on um, the connection between electric vehicles and uh, renewable energy climate, I think if you just look at the, the U.S. states and also the international countries that have um, ambitious EV policies, they also tend to have uh, relatively ambitious renewable energy deployment issues. So maybe the, uh, necess- the direct link is not that necessary because the, these policy goals co- um, coexist. Yeah, well, it, and I think the other sort of interesting point on that is, you know, a lot of times there's there are effort is a very complicated relationship between the power supply and the EVs, and so it's a one that I don't think people understand in a lot of different ways. I agree with you; it's interesting for a lot of folks. The idea of using EVs to grow the market for renewable energy is a really good opportunity. It's also one I think that that can come with some conflicts too, right? For folks that don't that aren't aligned with that objective, and so it makes it it makes it difficult if your EV policy is driven by something else. But um, well, you know, as luck would have it, here we are at the end of uh, the allotted time. I just want to say a really big thanks to Nick and Garrett and Jonas uh, for joining us today. We'll continue this conversation, but I found this really enlightening, and I hope all of you did too. So please uh, join me in thanking my colleagues for being here today. Thank you.